Welcome everyone to another episode of Encounter with God Together. I have with me today, Johnny Radcliffe. Johnny was just at our, um, a beach gathering this past uh, November sharing with the leaders gathered there about Gen Z and millennials and all the all the alphabet that we need to know about, even a little Gen Alpha, right, Johnny? That's right. That's and right. He is a, a coord national coordinator of resource development for the, um, I always stumble on the name here, but I'm going to get it, the National Network of Youth Ministries. Yes, sounds right. <laughs> and so he is a bit of an expert in youth ministry, which is wonderful to have uh, access to as uh, a ministry that's trying to reach this generation. And mm -hmm. he's been in pastoral student ministry for over 15 years. Johnny, it's really great to see you again. And uh, I know you're going to have some good, good things for us tonight. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm going to pray for you and uh, we can get started with this week's readings. Sounds good. Father, I do thank you for Johnny. I thank you for the, the students' lives that he has touched over the years and is touching and reaching now for the leaders that he's equipping to reach this generation. And I pray that his work will bear fruit and that you will bear fruit in and through him uh, even now as he shares. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Over to you. Yeah, thank you. This is, uh, this is a passage you got to buckle up for today. And uh, if you're listening to this uh, and if you're a part of Scripture Union at all, we all know, hey, it's in the name, right? Scripture. Yeah. So it's our privilege to wrestle and to study and to just be amazed by God and how he works. And uh, this passage is no exception. So I'm excited to dive in. I love to nerd out so if if you're someone who like likes going deep into the scripture hopefully we're gonna have some fun today uh, but something else you need to know about me is that i'm, I'm a pretty like even keeled guy pretty patient uh but crazy about my kids i have four they're everywhere uh you come to my house they're hanging from the ceiling they're, they're just <laughs> stuffing them in corners like i have more kids than i have square footage in my home and uh my oldest, her name's Lael, and she's this amazing, like, sweet little biscuit who is just a good-hearted truther through and through. And I remember towards the beginning of putting her in the church nursery. You know what I mean? Like, that's like a big step. And I remember her kind of toddling over, and it, you know, it's almost like you, you, it, Felt like I took my kid to college, you know. <laughs> she's going over. I see her play with this thing. I'm like, oh, she's playing with the toy. But then, like, everything went white rage because in that moment, she had a toy sitting there in her angelic innocence. And this little brat of a kid comes up and rips the toy out of her hand and starts walking that way. And she's just there stunned. And like this rage just welled up in me. And like, there's one thought I had. It was, you will go to jail if you punt someone's child. <laughs> so I refrained. <laughs> uh, it's probably a good you know, call. Yeah, probably. Like, you know, jail's <laughs> not for me, I don't think. But it's that, it's that dad Hulk smash that rises up in you. You know what I mean? Like for moms, it's called the mama bear. For dads, I don't know what it is. It's that like thing. And um, now that she's nine years old and in third grade, there she has different variations of this where she tells about this one boy who's just, I mean, I can say this, he's a miserable creature that I have no sympathy for and makes her life harder at school. And I just want to say like, I, I will end this kid. Tell me when and where. I'll, you know, it's that like that dad protective instinct. Yes. And... I think on some level that's God given. And I think it actually represents who he is. I think our God is very defensive of his children. And you're going to see that come through this passage. And in fact, I would say that as you step back and look at Exodus 10, 11, 12, 13, these, you know, it's a big chunk. But if you really looked at it, you would see that the theme of this is that Yahweh would move heaven and earth for his people. Mm. Literally. Mm. Look at the plagues. I mean, it's nuts. So we know that he's going to keep his covenant to Abraham. Whether the people who are enslaved in Egypt really felt that intimacy or not, 
looking back, we can say, just hang on. He's going to keep his promise. The promised land's coming. So he's got to do whatever it takes to get them out. And it's interesting because we pick up in the middle of the plagues. We're at plague number eight. And I'm going to jump into Exodus 10, 7 and read this. It said, Pharaoh's officials said to him, how long will this man be a snare to us? Let the people go so they can worship their God. Do you not yet realize Egypt is ruined? Then Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh. He said, go worship the Lord your God, he said. But tell me who's going to be going. Moses answered, we will go with our young and old, with our sons and daughters, and with our flocks and herds, because we are here to celebrate the festival to the Lord. Pharaoh said, Lord be with you. If I let you go, along with your women and children, clearly you have bent on evil. No, have only the men go and worship the Lord, since that's what you've been asking for. Then Moses and Aaron were driven out as Pharaoh's presence. So Pharaoh has that kind of... Uh, megalomaniac, narcissistic, like crazy ruler, fly off the handle thing going for sure. And he's focusing on the minute detail of like, oh, no, no, you can't take everyone. Okay, Pharaoh, we've done this thing, you know, hail and, you know, frogs, like, okay, Pharaoh, this is something to focus on. So from this point, plague eight comes and it's the locusts. The locusts swarm in, they take all of the things that were, uh, all of the food that was left by the hail. And really, it sometimes we miss that, like, this really hits their ability to survive, to provide, to eat, makes them super vulnerable. So then after this, he sobers up pretty quickly in verse 16, he says this, Pharaoh quickly summoned Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned against the Lord and against you. Oh, oh, this guy, he's, re- you know, just renting his heart. He is ready. Verse 17. Now forgive my sin once more and pray to the Lord, your God, to take this deadly plague away from me. Wow. Genuine repentance, right? Verse 18, it says, Moses then left Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord. And the Lord changed the wind with a very strong west wind, which caught up the locusts and carried them into the Red Sea. Pretty cool. Not a locust was left anywhere in Egypt, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he would not let the Israelites go. That's interesting. But after this, we get to the ninth plague, darkness. So darkness comes over the land for three days. It only hits the Egyptians. And the Bible makes it very clear that the Israelites were there at, they had light. They saw everything. There was peace. Fascinating. I don't know how that happened, but he's God, so he can do it. So... We're about to jump into chapter 11. My hope is to really summarize this and then like do a little bit of playing around with mm-hmm. it. Absolutely. So as we go to verse 11, we're going to read verse or chapter 11, verse 4. We see this. So Moses said, this is what the Lord says about midnight. Oh, this is where it gets real. Here we go. Tenth final plague. It's the bad one. It's the one to shut them all down. It says about midnight, I will go through Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die. From the firstborn son of Pharaoh, who sits on the throne, to the firstborn son of the female slave, who is at her handmill, and all the firstborn cattle as well, there will be a loud wailing throughout Egypt, worse than has ever been or will ever be again. But among the Israelites, not a dog will bark at any person or animal. I love that line. Like, man, even the dogs are going to be licking your feet. Then you, that's kind of gross. I regret saying that. Then you <laughs> know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. So Passover is coming. It's going to be the knockout punch. So in Exodus 12, there are very specific instructions for the Passover festival. So all of the Hebrew people are instructed to have this festival, this feast that all points towards God's deliverance. And the big theme about the Passover festival is we got to get out of here. Everything is, let's hurry up, get on out. So we eat the meat. What's that? I said, don't sit down. Yeah, like, like, hey, we can't stay. We got to go. So even when you're eating the meal, you're in your traveler's clothes. You're not in your like comfy jammies. You're like ready to go. Um. Sorry, I'm getting too excited. Other instructions remain like, hey, the Passover lamb has to be spotless, blemishless, and anything that remains, you got to burn. 
bread, we ain't got time for that stuff to rise. You're going to have that flat matzo stuff that we eat, right? For communion. Anyone else there? You doing the matzo for communion? <coughs> and the blood on the door frames is what kept the spirit going through away from God's people. And in verse 29, it says this. At midnight, the Lord struck down the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon, and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night, and there was a loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. Goes on in verse 31 to say this. It says, during the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, up, oh, leave my people, you and all the Israelites, go worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said and go. And also bless me. I like how he slips that in there, right? Like, like give me a little something, geez. And then <clears throat> it says the Egyptians urged the people to hurry and leave the country. Wouldn't you do the same thing? Like if you're leaving there, you're like, yo, you guys came and now everything's messed up. Get on out. Makes sense. Mm. Uh, he said, for otherwise, we will all die. So the people took their dough before the yeast was added and carried it on their shoulders in their clothing. The Israelites did as Moses instructed and asked the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold for clothing. The Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people, and they gave them what they asked for. So they plundered the Egyptians. I love that. Uh, <laughs> on their way out, they just took like everything good. And it was what's fascinating about that is, hey, you're a nation now. You have an instant treasury, right? Like, you know, you got gold that you can play with. The, the economy was instantly boosted, better than stimulus checks. Uh, so for time's sake, definitely read verse 13 as they, or chapter 13, as they recount how good God is and how they're going to consecrate their next generation moving forward and what they've just seen. But after reading through this, we kind of get the big picture and remember that the idea of all of this is that God is moving heaven and earth for his people and to follow his word that he promised. But there are some things that pop up through this story. So I'm going to, I want to address one fun fact and then two tough questions, because these are the kind of things that my mind goes to. So here's the first thing. It says this. The fun fact is that the plagues were directly designed to go after Egyptian deities. Now, Gail, I got to ask you, have you heard this before? I have heard it, but not in the detail of level that I think you're going to review. So I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> oh, I would love to go all, of, all 10 of them, but I can only do the last three. But as you study the Egyptian deities, man, like, if there's a blade of grass, they're worshiping it. The sun was like their man. Ra, like that guy in the sky, like that was the like chief of it all. The What we know from Egyptian mythology is fascinating. But the fact that God says, hey, I'm bigger than this, so I'm going to beat down your gods, so great. Uh, in fact, the eighth plague uh, with the locusts went after the Egyptian god Seth. And he, you can see this first image, if we can throw that up there. He's a handsome fellow right there. Uh, so Seth is the god of chaos and havoc uh, and storms. And so uh, he's an important figure in their deity structure. So the fact that God comes in and is like, yeah, you guys think Seth is powerful? Boom, locust, chaos, disorder. I can do more damage than Seth can do. Huh. So it's just amazing how all of this is really structured to go after. I mean, for crying out loud, the way they worship the Nile, that first plague where it turned that to blood, turns everything upside down. And God just goes one by one by one by one down the whole thing. The mm. second one we look at is actually going after Ra, the sun god. Like I said, one of the most important deities then, in fact, uh, they believe that Pharaoh was like the physical embodiment of Ra or like his emissary, some kind of trippy something there. Uh, but three days of darkness shows that Ra is powerless against I am. Hmm, it's amazing. And there's, 
there's such a depth there because this is like war in the heavens. Now we know these are false deities, but the Egyptians didn't. So God's coming in to the Egyptians and saying like, hey, I'm smacking down your deities. But he also is doing this for the Hebrews and saying, hey, remember how you thought the Hebrew or the Egyptians were so powerful? How they were the ones? God saying, I am greater. I am greater every step of the way. The last one, taking the firstborn. Some people will say that uh, it went after Isis. He's a protector of the young. But this one actually went directly against Pharaoh. His own lineage and his own household was touched. And, you know, he lost firstborn mm -hmm. in there. It, it showed how vulnerable he was. So mm -hmm. one of those fun facts is that these plagues were very specific and intentional. And it went after the deity structures in the land. Hmm. So that's very interesting. I love this kind of stuff. Like when yeah. I, you know, I've heard this story since I was a young lad. And then when someone's kind of unveils that to you, you're just like, whoa, I'll never look at this stuff the same again. Yeah. You want to do a deep dive into the other plagues? I encourage anyone to do it. It's out there on the internet. Yeah. If it's on the internet, that. it must be true, right? <laughs> uh, so this next one, I'm going to move from that was the fun fact to now we're going to move to the tough question. So Gail, I'm going to put you on the spot right away. Uh oh. So here's the question that yeah. people have asked. As you read this story, it sounds like God is hardening Pharaoh's heart. Yeah. So how can he be in trouble when God is the one doing it? Yeah, good question. Good question. And I think, you know, the the, the Bible readings uh, last week, I think, touched on whether or not Pharaoh was just a pawn, you know, in, in God's hand. And, and uh, I think it's similar to the way people think sometimes about Judas, uh, yeah. you know, whether he was just a pawn. Um, but there is some evidence that Pharaoh made choices uh, because God did give him you know, the opportunity to repent. And uh, I think that's where Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so I think, you know, it's it's a tough one to, to really settle on, but it feels like it's a both end situation. And, and the exactly. Pharaoh's heart was kind of taking the lead, despite the fact that it says that God hardened it. Exactly. It's, and there are actually portions where it says Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Yeah. So it's kind of like, what do we believe? I don't know. But I will say this. There, there are two things that I know kind of working through this. Uh, it is kind of hard. But here's the first thing. Thought number one, this is a wicked dude. Like, I'm sorry. Like, we're talking about killing a bunch of Hebrew babies, you know, killing the boys. Like, that. that's where Moses comes onto the scene. You know, yeah. we're talking about enslavement. We're talking about worshiping deities that are other other than God. So like nowadays we don't love justice. You know what I mean? Like we kind of struggle with the justice hand of God. And there's a sense where you could even make the case that God was being merciful to Pharaoh by not wiping out all of Egypt. Yeah. I don't know. Like, you know, it's, it's not a great explanation, but we, sometimes we need to back up and say like, you know what, like God's just and all he does so I start from the place of what he does is good. So I'm going to try and understand how. Um, so in this situation, uh, when we kind of see like, hey, this was a dude who was opposing him directly and slavery and, you know, worshiping pagan deities, it's pretty crazy. In fact, when you jump to Romans 9, uh, it says this in verse 16, it says, it does not therefore depend on human desire, on effort. Or effort, but on God's mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed to all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy and he hardens whom he wants to harden. So there's kind of this explanation of like God's God, everything he does is going to be just and fair. Uh, and he even used Pharaoh to accomplish his purposes. Isn't that kind of cool? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you so have to look at it in just the right angle or it, it seems seems scary, you know, but you're yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. 
if you start yeah. with what you know to be true, uh, you can see it through the right lens. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Here's the other thing, too. I think the purpose of the 10 plagues, more than anything, were to bolster the faith of the Hebrew people who felt beat down for 430 years. Like, think about that. That takes us almost to the year, like, what, like 1600, like, what, 1590? Like, you know what I mean? Like, it predates America. Like, imagine that long without hearing directly from God, without you know, seeing directly from his hand, that's a long time. So yes. God is saying like, hey, I am going out of my way to prove how real I am, how I'm still with you. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And look what I can do. I made my promise. I'm going to keep it. I think mm. if Pharaoh repented at plague three and they're out in the wilderness, it'd be easy to forget God. And they were mm. a pretty forgetful bunch as it was. So I think God said, I need these 10 displays to show that I'm more powerful than Egypt and you can trust me. So whatever it was going to take, God was going to do that to accomplish his plan. So that's one thing you can do a deep dive on the internet. If you want to go further into free will and stuff like that, like, whoo, that's, you can spend hours. Um, so that was the first tough question. And the next one, I'm just going to breathe briefly touch on there are some people the, the next tough question is this were the plagues real um i'm gonna say absolutely gail you're mm -hmm. with me you're gonna say absolutely right, right? right. Yeah. like yeah <laughs> yeah so uh some people were, try to fabricate this thing like well the blood in the red sea was actually an algae that you know came down for and i'm just like no 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 god's real or he's not the bible's real or it's not so these plagues were actual acts of God as described. And some extra biblical proof. I'm not going to get the name of this right. I think it's the Ipuer Papyrus. I don't know how to say it. I, I, mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> I was going to say it, was, it wasn't something I read in high school, but I-P-U-W-E-R Papyrus was discovered in the 19th century. And... I got this off of gotquestions.org. So if you want to find more, you can look it up. There are excerpts of this person, not a believer, not a follower of Jesus, who goes through and describes things like plague is throughout the land. Blood is everywhere. The river is blood. Like it's you read this and you're like, oh, my word, this is an Egyptian account of the plagues. So wow. cool. I nerd out on that stuff all the time. But for time's sake, you know, we'll just have to let you guys research that on your own. Um, but with that being said, uh, we talked about the fun fact, uh, God, God's plagues went after the deities, uh, the tough question, why did God harden Pharaoh's heart? We talked about, you know, the plagues being real, but here are my last three thoughts over the situation. Uh, as we read through this passage, and hopefully you will, hopefully you'll read it for yourself and just really get a good feel of it. Three observations that I see. Number one, some people just won't get it. There are going to be people where they harden their own hearts, where they, no matter what life circumstances throw at them, they're not going to focus on God. They're going to be kind of stuck in their ways. And they're, they could be people we love, people in our own family that we truly care about. And sometimes we can sit back and be like, how could you miss this? Like God's doing this. Like, how could you not see this? But there are going to be, be some people who just have hard hearts that aren't ready to turn towards God. And there's always hope, but just to acknowledge that that's out there. There are others that operate like Pharaoh in this world. Uh, the second thing is this. I said it before. I'm going to say it again. God will move heaven and earth for his children. He's got that daddy Hulk smash thing about him too. <laughs> he protects his own and um, he, he'll do what he has to for his kids. And then observation number three, he keeps his promises. Even after 400, 430 years of silence, he's going to keep his promises. Uh, so maybe in year 200, you started talking to the Hebrew people and they would say, he's gone. He forsook us. We'll be here forever. But then 200 years later, God's going to show up in a big way and lead them to the promised land. So 
hopefully mm-hmm. there's something in there to inspire you to dig further to to see the big picture and just really see how God's fingerprints all over human history is wonderful and orchestrated. Thank you so much, Johnny. That's great. Great, great research and good food for thought there. Thank you. Uh, you and I tell you, I, I'll pray us out if that's okay. Yeah, that would be great. All right, let's pray. Uh, God, we thank you for what we see in this passage. We thank you for um, just the way you step up for your kids. Pray that you'll help us as we try to think of these huge things like you and your justice and your righteousness and how it comes together. Pray that we will always be intrigued and marvel at it and never overwhelmed. Pray that uh, upon listening this episode that you'll have people who are inspired to dig deeper. So we ask this all in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, That was wonderful. And I just want to do a little plug for you. This was not rehearsed. But uh, as I said earlier, we did have Johnny speak uh, at a retreat, a gathering that we hosted to talk about our beach ministry. And he did a wonderful job educating those of us there about the issues in today's youth culture. And he also speaks to youth themselves. Yes. Themselves. Them, uh, themselves. Uh, and so, Johnny, I know you just uh, you just put up a website. Um, can you remind me what the URL is? Yeah, so it's my name, but here's the kicker. It's the easiest, hardest name to spell. So uh, <laughs> it's johnnyradcliffe.com, and that's J-O-N-N-Y-R-A-D-C-L-I-F-F. No H and Johnny, no E in Radcliffe. That's it. So uh, if you would like, if you are in need ever of a speaker on these topics or for this uh, demographic, I can highly commend him. I'm going to be writing a review for his site. So thank you. Appreciate so it. he did a great job. And um, and for those of you who are just coming upon us, we're, we're going through the readings in the Encounter with God uh, quarterly guide that you can get in print or in your email or read each day online at um, scriptureunion.org which I'll put the URL there at the bottom. And uh, so please visit our site and find out more about that if you'd like to follow along. We've been working through the book of Exodus, as you can hear. And um, Johnny, I know we'll have you back again. I'd love Uh, to do it. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Have a great week, everyone.